Um, we're going to try and bring the day to a start. Um, we have a few more that are still signing in, so there might be little interruptions along the way, but we apologize for that. Um, I'd like to just start with a few simple house rules here just to inform people for health and safety reasons. Um, please, if there's any event of any fire or anything else, exit through these two doors and there's a staircase to the right of the elevators. Can you hear me? Just a little bit. Hello, is that any better? Okay, I'm going to have to bend down a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, please make your way out of the building, down through the staircases and out to the front where we, we can meet and check everybody's okay. Um, I just also want to tell you that for this event we have um, put everything on an app which everybody should register for, so all of the agendas and the various presentations and contact details of all the speakers and attendees are on this app so you can communicate and connect with each other easily. That's part of the networking uh, objective of the plan. And for those who are, want to work on Twitter, if you can hashtag us, I think it's SEI Science Forum, hashtag SEI Science Forum, so uh, please use that. Um, I still see we have a few arriving, but I will start to keep us on time. Um, I would like to take the opportunity to welcome you all here to the 2017 SEI Annual Science Forum. Uh, in particular, I would like to welcome Johan Schulestina, our Executive Director from SEI, uh, Schirsten Nieblis, the Chair of the Board from SEI, it's a pleasure to have you both here. Professor Bundit Euroborn from the President of Chulalongkorn University and a, a new very welcome partner, so thank you very much for joining us. Dr. Wijan Simachaya, uh, the Permanent Secretary from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment, uh, pleasure to have you along with us today. And Charlotte Mam, the Head of Development Cooperation from the Embassy of Sweden, uh, also a valued partner. And Dr. Stefano Fotinou, um, Director, Environment and Development for UNSCAP. Um, and to all our distinguished uh, panelists and to everybody else, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for, for coming. <coughs> um, I'm delighted to have you all here today. It's a, a special event for us today. It's the first time we've held this SEI forum outside of Sweden. So it's something new for us here. And it's also extra special that we're holding it with our partner in Chulalongkorn University, where today we're also signing an MOU with them, looking forward towards our future partnership. It's also their 100 year celebration, so it's uh, very timely for the university, so uh, happy birthday. Um, you don't look any older than 50, so it's okay. Um, today, we intend to forge a stronger and deeper relationship by develop developing this MOU <coughs> to encourage greater sharing and learning and supporting the research we need today to solve the challenges that we all face now and face in the future. Um, I would like to thank all of the SEI Asia team who've put in a tremendous job to get the logistics and all of the agendas ready for us here. Um, I think they've done an amazing job, so thank you all uh, individually. Um, and also for bringing us to what we hope is a, a generally a paperless forum and a plastic-free forum. So we're trying to practice what we preach. So you have it on your apps, please use the apps and avoid printing. And we have plenty of water in different stations here, use your glasses. So Asia is changing rapidly uh, in so many different ways. And yet, at the same time, it's changing slowly and on an unsustainable path in many other ways. There have been positive changes in education, in access to information, in infrastructure, economic growth, in technology, and in many other areas, all of which provides us with many opportunities to share, to learn, and to grow sustainably. However, sadly, this is not the reality. We face many challenges, including climate change, population and migration and urbanization, surging energy demands, natural resource depletion, a growing inequality amongst the rich and poor. The road we are currently on is simply not sustainable nor equitable. So we must change paths. We must look towards an equitable and sustainable future. We need to ensure gender equality and social equity throughout the Asia region and through greater understanding and support of and delivery of the sustainable development goals which we've all signed up to. We must build greater capacity for resilient societies to face the extreme challenges in the uncertain times ahead. And we also try to support us through our work on reducing disaster risk. We must address the pending issues of climate change and work towards understanding potential future scenarios and work with science to secure a fair and equitable future for all, and particularly the commitments that we have within the Paris Climate Agreement, all of which will be discussed in more detail here today. But we must also focus on other issues such as urbanization and its impacts, on people, their health and well-being, on pollution and air quality, on energy demands, on water use and management and a host of other critical issues which we hope to explore in some detail over the coming few days. We have to encourage inclusiveness in this dialogue. We have to make sure that we're able to support equitable governance in all of the resources that we need. 
and this is not an easy challenge. Today, we want to explore how SEI can use our evidence-based science to positively influence the policies that need changing. But we can only do this with you, our partners. We need to make sure that our partners and the valued partners within civil society, the private sector, the world of academia, and indeed here with government, where again I wish to thank the ministries from Thailand and also Taika for their warm support for us here, and again CEDA for their ongoing support to our work, not just here in the region, but globally. And it's through these partnerships that we can help co-produce the ideas that we have to take forward to setting our research agendas and to looking at the various policy options that we need to suggest in order to make the difference and to ensure we steer our futures on a more sustainable path. As we expand our work in the region, we need you to challenge us on the theories, on the questions, and on our approaches so that we ensure that we are taking the right approach, the right questions for research now that will provide the right options for the future. So I challenge you. And here at the Science Forum, this is a unique opportunity for us to gather those thoughts, the ideas, and your insights to help us develop both our relationships, our research, strengthen the partnerships that we have, and guide us to a more prosperous and sustainable future for all. So throughout the coming days, we, bet, we aim to better understand the future scenarios at play, to challenge the current thinking and planning, and to find options to help us support policy decision makers moving forward. So this is the simple challenge I set to you all today, is to speak up, engage with our colleagues and partners, start a discussion that may lead us on to further partnerships and interesting challenges and questions, and help us develop the evidence-based science we need to bridge the science and policy divide. I look forward to the event. I look forward to speaking with you all during the course of the days. Um, and uh, please enjoy yourselves fully. Thank you very much. I would now like to call upon the chair of our board, uh, Kirsten Nibles, for her opening remarks. Good morning, everybody, uh, friends and colleagues of SEI. It is uh, really a great pleasure to see so many outstanding representatives from SEI partners and uh, supporters, and of course from SEI itself at this science forum, which for the first time takes place here in Bangkok. It is uh, a privilege for us to be able to arrange this um, at the Chulalongkorn University. And we are also very honored to have the president, Professor Yua Arporn, uh, with us this morning. We uh, value highly our collaboration with your university, which will be confirmed today by the signing of a memorandum of understanding to build a lasting and relevant partnership, a memorandum that should be very much alive and vigorous. Links to uh, universities are crucial for all of SEI's centers. Our mission is to promote policy decision making that is based on research and evidence. Research is the key of a sustainable future. Without research, we would not be able to identify and understand the threats to our planet. We need natural science, we need social science, we need humanities. And research is also necessary, together with technology, to provide answers and solutions. Chulalongkorn University is strong in engineering sciences, and engineers are hugely important in finding ways to prevent damage to the environment and to restore damage already inflicted. But we also need to build bridges from research to the policy makers. And uh, we are very uh, pleased with the ambition of Chulalongkorn University to uh, play an active role in society. SCI has centers all over the world. Uh, the Bangkok Center is our foothold in Asia. Thailand was selected as the best country to operate in, and we have never regretted that. Our center here is in a very dynamic phase. 
We have um, an excellent new uh, center director, Niall O'Connor, and uh, the center is growing thanks to um, fruitful interaction with key partners. We uh, are very grateful to um, SIDA, the Swedish Agency for Development Cooperation, and happy to see Anne-Charlotte Malm here. Uh, we um, are also very much indebted to TICA, uh, and uh, we uh, also value our collaboration with the UNS CAP and are happy to see Dr. Uh, Futiu here. Uh, we uh, appreciate highly also our very good contacts with the, uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment. And um, very pleased to see Dr. Sima Chaya, an old friend of SCI, here this morning. Uh, we look forward in the coming years to um, uh, deepening and strengthening the relationship with uh, your uh, beautiful country um, and uh, to the benefit of um, uh, our society and to take some steps on the way to the sustainable future that we all are working for. Thank you very much, uh, Shirsten. And uh, I'd like to briefly call Professor uh, Bundit Uraporn um, for opening remarks, please. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Dr. Christine Niblos, Chairman of the Board, SEI, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Chulalongkorn University, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all participants of SEI Science Forum 2017, especially to those who have traveled here from overseas. It is a great pleasure for Chulalongkorn University to be a hosting partner of this important event with the world's most influential environmental policy think tank, the Stockholm Environmental Institute, or SEI. As one of the objectives of SEI's Science Forum is to serve as a platform to build and strengthen links between researchers, stakeholders, and decision makers, and to offer the opportunity to find new ways to collaborate across disciplines and to develop innovative ideas. Partnership between SEI and Chulalongkorn University in hosting the present forum marks an initial effort to linkage and collaboration this even aims to foster. It also counts as the first activity after the signing of the Memorandum of Understanding between the two institutions, which will take place right after the opening panel discussion session. SEI and Chulalongkorn University have, in fact, enjoyed successful academic cooperation for over a decade. This Memorandum of Understanding shows our commitment to closer and deeper partnership, which involves collaboration at both strategic institutional and individual operational levels. It also comes at a very important time in a year of centennial celebration of our university, a time when we are looking forward to the second century of more tangible positive impact on society, not only domestically, but also internationally. After the signing of this MOU, we expect to see more joint research programs which helps address issues facing our society. 
in the decades ahead, many challenges are waiting here in Asia, and perhaps also elsewhere, comprising climate change and disaster, environmental degradation, and natural resource depletion that come with urbanization, conflicts that arise from inequality or intolerance. This forum provides a great opportunity for researchers, decision makers, and other stakeholders to come up with ways to tackle those challenges together. As a comprehensive university with expertise in diverse disciplines, ranging from science technology to social science and humanities, we look forward to working with you in the years to come for a resilient and equitable future for all. In closing, I would like to wish you a productive meeting and every success in your endeavor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your welcoming remarks and we look forward to our next 100 years together. Uh, what a marriage. Okay, uh, on with the show. We want to make sure that we're trying to keep on time today. Um, so I would like to call on Dr. Chianis as the lead for the opening session, uh, Understanding Enhancing Science for Evidence-Based Policy Towards Equitable Resilience and Sustainable Future for All. Dr. Chianis. Thank you very much, Niall. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to be the moderators of this very important opening panel discussion. The title of today's session is How We Could Enhance the Science for Evidence-Based Policy Towards an Equitable, uh, Resilient, and Sustainable Futures for All. I think this session comes very timely. As you know, Asia has been transformed rapidly in the recent decades. We have very fast and high economic development growth population growth, and also most of the time we look at urbanization. This is something happening so fast. So most of the time, this kind of change actually has transformed or changed the landscape and society. And we could see that a lot of people's um, livelihoods have been improved. However, we cannot avoid impacting the environment and sometimes widening the gap in the society. How can we make this better? How we can support the country leaders to continue to grow, but then without impacting so much to environment and make so big equality in the society? So we have five great speakers today who will help us and suggest the way forward, how policies and science could really inform the policy for a more sustainable future. May I invite the first panelist to be on the stage, uh, Professor Bandit Uaton from Jualongga University. He's the president of Jualongga University who kindly hosts ACI for almost 10 years. The next panelist to be on stage is uh, Anna Charlotte Mang, head of development corporation, the Embassy of Sweden, Thailand, so CEDAS has been supporting SCI for a very long, long time, and we are very privileged to have her to be a wonderful speaker on the stage. The next speaker, Dr. Vijan Simachaya, Permanent Secretary of Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment in Monterey. Dr. Vijan has been a great supporter to the SCI and also Sustainable Mekong Research Network. He's not only giving the opening speech like this, Sometimes he gives us a lecture how the researcher could communicate better to the policy makers like him. So you can see how he will speak today, and then we learn a lot from him. The next speaker from uh, UNSCAP, Dr. Stefano Fortu, Director of Environment and Development Division. So we have a very good cooperation with UNSCAP recently, and also we hope to do more in the future. The last but not least speakers, my dear friend, Arthur, Dr. Arthur Gegler Sovatling, Research Directorate from SCI, who is flying from Stockholm for this event. Please give a big hand to all speakers.
Today, please take these panels as an opening, and then feel free to actively participate in the discussion. So this panel will not help us answer the big questions to the world audience, but actually will help me as a mother to answer a few questions of my son. Recently, our house was flooded, and then many people need to walk through the flood. And some people drive a car, some people ride a bicycle, some people take a motorcycle. My son asked why people take different approach for doing this. He was he's seven years old. And I say because people have not enough money. Sometimes they're poor, sometimes it's their choices. And then he asked, how many the poor now? And how will we be the poor in the future? I couldn't answer him with the confidence. And he sometimes asked me what will be like in the future. So as a mother, I have to tell him something. But then the way I tell him, I say, oh, let me find some statistics. And I will tell you, at least for the time being, for the current stage. But how about the future? I'm so lucky to have the great speakers who are leading on many aspects here to help me answer my son. We have the policy maker who can make a good policy. We have uh, donors and also the brand partners who provide the fund to many good initiatives. And we also have the world leading research academic and also kind of uh, to do good research to inform the society. So let's see what is the first question today. That the first question that I would like to ask the panels to help me answer my son is, what will the future look like for Asia? So consider what are the challenges, what are the opportunities when we look forward to the next 10 and 20 years. Could you tell me how can I explain my son? So this question to all the panelists, and I actually request them to prepare only one photo originally, and then there's some negotiation. Can we do one slide instead? Yes. Let's see the first slide from whom. So who this slide belong to? Can you pick your microphone and please explain? How could you imagine the future of Asia so big with eight photos? Please pick up your microphone. Shot. As a policy maker, I like to hear a very short message. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, actually, uh, uh, they asked me to provide one photo, but uh, my responsibility in the Ministry of Natural Resources uh, and Environment cannot uh, explain by uh, one photo. But yeah, okay, I, I said to her, okay, I have one photo, but uh, inside, I'm going to put many uh, 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 photo uh, inside, uh, but uh, she says, okay. Uh, you can see here uh, our uh, challenge in the near, near future. Climate change is very important, uncertain uh, problem that I think uh, ASEAN uh, or Asia are going to facing that problem. How we ready uh, to dealing with the problem also very, very important. In Thailand, right now, we also develop our 20-year uh, uh, strategy uh, for uh, protecting natural resources and environment. Uh, climate change is one uh, of the issues that uh, we are uh, going to work with. Since your son is still quite young, uh, I'm going to explain uh, the simple way uh, you can see here. Uh, when you talk about the, the, the Asia or even ASEAN, what is the problem? How research can, can help uh, to uh, solve that problem? Uh, I can say that in, in our region, for the basic or for the common uh, problem we still uh, facing, for example, uh, people in uh, Sweden may not uh, necessarily to talk about the garbage management, but for our country, for our uh, region, uh, garbage is very important. If you are in Bangkok, 
uh, a couple of days ago, we have uh, facing with the, uh, 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 the flooding. Uh, the major uh, cause of flooding is the, also the garbage. Uh, there is uh, approximately the garbage in, in the canal, in the water is uh, allowed uh, 20 ton per day. Uh, uh, just why we are facing the problem. Why, uh, why people are not aware of that? That's also behavior, also very important. Uh, when we talk about the future of, of uh, Asia, connectivity also very important. First, we start with the economic development uh, tied to uh, fill gap, especially for the, the uh, property eradication also in, in, in the region we concern, but uh, moving toward for the, the uh, property eradication, uh, economic is really important, but when people talk about economic, most of the, the region, when we, we uh, try to uh, increase our uh, GDP, natural resource and environment is uh, really uh, important how we utilize that uh, to uh, increase the, our, the, uh, our income is very important. Uh, just why the, uh, the uh, utilizing, uh, protecting, and preserve uh, environment uh, is very important. Uh, you can see here, uh, here is the sustainable development goal. Not just only the country, but the region and the world have to uh, move forward uh, to uh, meet the uh, sustainable development goal in the year 2020 in Thailand, especially in the Ministry of Natural Resources and uh, Environment. Uh, we are also taking care of the uh, five sustainable development goals, in including uh, water, uh, including the uh, land uh, and the marine uh, environment and climate change, uh, sustainable consumption and pro production, and uh, biological uh, diversity is also the key issue that uh, right now we set our target, uh, how we can move uh, to the, our target for protecting the uh, environmental and natural resources in, in our country. For example, I can give you some example for the forest cover Right now, we have the uh, cover, uh, forest cover around uh, 32 percent, but uh, the government uh, plan to ahead uh, for the next 20 years. Uh, we plan Sorry, to Dr. have Vichan, the. Sorry, Can you wrap up? Sorry. Can Pardon you me? wrap up? Wrap up. Yeah, wrap up. Okay, very soon. I think my for son the, already the, confused. The, uh, so 40 percent for the whole country. <laughs> At, uh, you can see here that is the common. Uh, uh, environmental problem for, for Asia and even for Thailand and for other uh, countries uh, in, 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 in the region. Uh, SDG, we are so going to move forward, but how we dealing with the common problem and ready uh, for uncertain uh, pollution problem or the climate change in the near future is very really important. Thank you so much. It sounds the future is so scary. At least for my son, he loves marine animals, like to go aquacus, like aquarium so much. But here, they, we have a big task in the future. Let's move on. Thank you so much, Dr. Vitan. Let's move on to the next photo. What is this? How can I ex explain him? This is uh, Stefano's futures. Thank for you. Asia. Good morning from my side too. So yes, I mean, it took me some time to select just one photo. And um, I mean, very frankly, um, I don't have kids, but I spent an entire evening with my wife choosing the photo that we will have here. And I choose this because it encompasses three key words that for me are very important for the future of Asia. The first one is that I, I hope you will agree. I mean, this is the facade of a building. This is the facade of a building, and it's from an Asian country. And I hope you will agree with me that this is something we can call a, a modern building. So one key word for me is modernization. Uh, there's a lot of infrastructure in Asia, a lot of infrastructure that is connected to the Sustainable Development Goals needs to be modernized. 
And then there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be built and needs to be modern. And having modernized infrastructure means we need very good technology. So one important element is that we need huge technological advances on the way we are managing resources, on the way we are building infrastructure, on the way we are doing our economy and our business to be sustainable. The second key word uh, is green, which for me uh, talks about environmental sustainability. Ah. And what I like in this photo is that you will see the green, it's embedded in the structure of the building. There is a kind of misunderstanding. We need to have a tendency to think that the environment is a side dish in the entire menu of sustainable development. And this is not correct. We need to embed environmental sustainability into everything we do. So we need to embed environmental sustainability in economic policies, in technological policies, in research policies. And what I like in this photo is that you see everywhere this green, which is, which is a real, uh, these are real plants. Um, it's not a kind of decoration. These are real plants in the building. And it, it showcases, you know, to maintain such a kind of structure, you also need an amazing management of your resources, of your water, of your energy, of your soil, because there's some soil there, of your minerals, of everything. So managing sustainable, the natural resources, it's an extremely important element for sustainability in Asia and the Pacific. And actually, if we look at the 2030 agenda, we will see that there is a specific phrase that it's even above the 17 sustainable development goals that says that, in, that sustainability cannot be achieved without the sustainable management of natural resources. Now, these two keywords, you know, the modernity slash technology and environmental sustainability, were very much, I, I think, explicit in this photo. You can see it. There's another element that I will call it a little bit implicit. This building has a lot of glasses. And for me, when I hear the word glass, immediately the, the key word that comes to my mind is transparency. So I think future development in Asia needs to be transparent. And transparent means three things. First of all, it needs to be inclusive. In, it, it needs to include everyone. Uh, everybody needs to express their needs. Second, it should be integrated. We cannot have a transparent, inclusive development if we just focus on one aspect. And the third, it needs to be based on partnerships. So my future for Asia is I want to see Asia that it's modern, embeds environmental sustainability in everything, and it's doing this in a transparent way. Thank you. Thank you. So we need a combination, brick glass and also green. Thank you so much. So let's see the next futures of Asia, what we look like. So this sounds promising. So could someone explain me what is this? Thank you. I will try to do that. And good morning, everybody. Uh, First, I would like to start with that the, the rapid economic growth in Asia has been very positive to lift many people out of poverty. And an opportunity is that the economic growth is predicted to continue in most part of Asia. So the challenge here is to make it sustainable, promoting human rights and the environment. So uh, the links between environmental sustainable development, human rights, and equality are clear in Asia. And that is especially for people living in poverty. Environmental and climate problems affect people's lives and rights, such as the access to food, access to water, sanitation, and health. And another challenge is the democratic deficit and lack of respect for human rights that hampers people's ability to demand accountability and to contribute to the dialogue and decision making for more sustainable development. Mm -hmm. It is also a challenge that there are major economic differences between countries and subregions and large inequalities within countries. So an, imp in, um, uh, an opportunity is to improve cooperation within countries, but also between countries for more inclusive development and improved regional cooperation to address transboundary issues. 
So these pictures, this picture, uh, illustrate the process for development plans and decisions in the future. So the process is open and transparent, with clear rules and good laws made by the government. These rules and laws are based on good scientific facts produced by independent researchers. Civil society is informed and engaged in the process and is able to participate and influence. And private sector behaves responsible, contributes to sustainable development, and respects human rights. Thank you so much. This sounds like ideal society, whereas I would like my son to live it. So let's move on to the another option for the futures of Asia. Someone making a little bit me, for me nervous. We see something here. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, from these pictures, you can see that uh, I put some challenges based on the fact that uh, our world is now approaching uh, more and more aging society, and especially in Asia. You can see that uh, the ratio between the people aged 65 and more to the, to the uh, people of the age under 65, th this ratio will be increasing uh, in most countries in Asia. So I think uh, the fact is that uh, we are approaching aging society and uh, as the moderator mentioned to, him, to her son, that uh, when we talk about poor, the words of poor, uh, what does it mean? Uh, when we talk about poor on wealth or poor on health or some others. I think uh, with the aging society and when we take into account the new technology development, I think um, there are challenges and opportunities in themselves. For the the aging society, how can we make our society not poor, but more happy or happier? And that is, uh, I think, the key words and the key uh, issue that uh, is very challenging to our society. The other picture may show us about the resource and environment issue. That is also very important. We know that when people get wealthier, we consume more. And with the more consumption, we have more impact in terms of a negative impact, and uh, especially to the, to the environment. And uh, on top of that, we know that uh, when we talk about poor or rich, it creates the inequality in society. And it, that is also very challenging. But the problem is that all these challenges, how can we turn it to, to be more, uh, to be happier? not poor. I touch upon the technology, especially on the digital technology or Internet of Things, or robotics, or artificial intelligence, or technology. We need to accept that when uh, new technologies come in, it, it, des it destroys some jobs. But also, but at the same time, it creates new jobs, new opportunities. So the society needs to adapt themselves in advance, not just only uh, wait for the, the time it comes, otherwise too late. When I talk about robotic, artificial intelligence, and uh, Internet of Things, we can see that uh, there are a lot of things to, to be uh, adapted. And uh, also, uh, more opportunities opened up, especially on the new way of uh, uh, behavior of society. We need to uh, implement uh, the technology properly, and we need to adapt ourselves. Like for, uh, we know that some jobs will, de will be destroyed, but it creates some more opportunity jobs. Like uh, when people get wealthier, uh, we tend to be more leisure. Working time, working hour, maybe decreased it. So the jobs that are concerned more uh, working intensive or working hours intensive will be needed 
to adapt themselves far in advance. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think the key word for this photo is how we can turn crisis into opportunities and then we can go to the hospital without any fear. So that's very interesting. So let we move to the last but not least slides. This is, looks very comprehensive. So Dr. Asa is trying to explain Asia in 12 photos. She told me that this not really cover the whole thing. I said, I told her this is very good already. You have very good coverage. You have the highest number of photos in your slide. So can you please explain how we can deal with this situation? Yes, thanks for inviting me and it's a privilege to represent SCI here. And I believe I'm the only one not working in the region. So I've been following uh, the developments from a, some distance. Uh, yes, this is quite ambitious. Uh, and I'm, tr I'm going to try and run through them quite quickly. But I think they reflect the, what I see as the main opportunities and, and challenges in the region. So picture one uh, is about poverty in my, uh, in my view, so, which I think is still the biggest challenge. I mean, despite economic development over the past uh, decades, I think there's still, I mean, we're still facing unequal distribution of, of uh, wealth, increasing inequalities, such as gender inequality. And there's a trend towards increasing urban poverty high levels of migration and, and impacts on environmental well-being. And picture two and three is about, uh, well, climate change and natural disasters, which I think will continue and hit the region hard, unfortunately. Um, uh, and it's causing enormous human, environmental, and economic losses. Um, and it reflects vulnerability of um, um, cities in Asia, including poor, water and sanitation, uh, poor flood management systems, and so on. And then the picture, uh, the second row, <laughs> is uh, these reflect the modern uh, side of Asia. Modern lifestyles, new consumption patterns, uh, and also Asia spearheading technological development. Um, uh, but also there are negative re trends when it comes to rapid urbanization, environmental degradation, um, traffic, poor air quality, health-related aspects, obviously, and also challenges of achieving um, more sustainable production and consumption and resource efficiency. In the and then we have, yeah, if we go to the bottom, um, these are, yeah, a bit of contrast to the what I just talked about. This uh, represents the um, rural, traditional Asia, uh, which is very rich in biodiversity. However, there is an increasing vulnerability of ecosystems. It's extremely high, and there's increasing pressure on land and forests, which poses threats to food security, not least, uh, while also facing rapidly increasing global and regional food demand. And then we have the one belt to one road, which is um, about geopolitical developments. So when it comes to future oh, and the opportunities, I'm, I'm looking at this third row, which is about regional and global policy agreements. The regional forum on sustainable energy and, and uh, uh, technology and the SDG process and also the Sendai Framework for climate, uh, for disaster risk reduction. So we're missing the one on Paris Agreement on climate change here. Yeah. Thank thanks. you. Arthur, sorry to need to cut you off. So it seems that we have a lot of challenges that we need to face, but also positive trends. However, you can see here we have many global and regional agreements that try to tackle with the situation. And now, very important question. I need to answer the next question to my side. Someone can move here. OK. So let's see. The next question is, considering, considering this phenomena, the futures, quite diversities in Asia, and also the regional international capacity and agreement and societal behavior. Are we ready 
to address the problems, challenges in the future? Can we confirm our kids and next generation that you will have beautiful, ideal society to live it? So what I have asked the panel is we have the smiley face and also the sad face here. You can only please pick up one side, don't do this, okay? So, and I ask few uh, colleagues sitting below there, Johan, you have one of them, and Dr. Hua, so we will, you can take a deep breath, and you will tell us what I should tell my son. Are we ready? One, two, three, and then you turn the side out, right? The one that we will pick is the one that you lean the side, that side out. One, two, three. What's that? Wow. I can't believe. So we have majority say no. And we have 40% say yes. How can I go back to talk with my... Oh, but we have more balance here. We have two more and one like sad face. Okay, now we need to take a side. So can I ask the participant to help me? I cannot say it's just neutral. It can be anything to the futures of Asia. If you believe that we are ready, can you show your two hands? No one? Phew. Clap five times. So loud. Five times. I count about 10%. So it seems that we are, the majority believe that we are not ready yet, despite many efforts. So the next question is why? So can I ask someone who say we are ready to give us a hint why we are ready to do this? Hello. Ladies, strong. Yes, we can, definitely. I think we can have a, handle the challenges if we increase the co cooperation across the region and find platforms where different stakeholders can meet and discuss and find common solutions. We need more cooperation. We work far too much in silos on often protecting our own interests. We have to be open and inclusive and work together, and I think that is the key. And the Swedish Development, uh, Regional Development Corporation in Asia and the Pacific supports several regional organizations and mechanisms for uh, cooperation. And we encourage our partners to uh, uh, cooperate with other organizations, both within the same thematic area that they are active in, but also with other organizations. And especially, we encourage uh, cooperation between the environment and human rights organizations. Uh, and in line with this, uh, as some of you know, we also host an annual workshop uh, to which we invite our partners and other stakeholders to work together and co-create around important issues like gender equality, business and human rights, anti-corruption and similar issues. And during the last workshops, it has become evident to us and, and everybody, I think, that we need to work more on human behavior to achieve behavior change for all of, all of us. Thank you. So thank you so much. Now we have representative the side sad face to say why we are not ready. Uh, thank you. I say no, we're not ready yet because of most of us, especially in uh, developed uh, uh, big country, uh, we still need uh, comfortable lifestyle and consume uh, a lot of uh, cheap and short-term uh, services and uh, uh, product. Uh, we need to use more natural resources uh, for our development. Uh, that's why uh, we need technology, innovation uh, to solve that problem, especially uh, uh, cannot uh, affordable in uh, developing uh, country, but uh, if uh, developing country support us, uh, research you mentioned uh, is also very important. Lastly, you just mentioned be happier. Uh, 
linked to education is very important in our country. Already mentioned, uh, people just throw the garbage mm -hmm. and flooding in the city. Thank, Thank you. you. That's very interesting. So we have two kind of extreme uh, suggestion about the future. We are ready or not. So the next question is, even majority here say we are not ready, but we have some good suggestion. So let us move on to the next question to the panel. So can someone please change for me to the next slide? It doesn't work. The next question, considering the work that you do in, in cooperation with SEIs and other institutes, what will be your recommendations in terms of science and policy support to help redesigning and improving the futures? Some of them, some of us say we are not ready. Some of us say we will have some very good futures for our societies. So maybe let's start, um, um, because Anna Charlotte already mentioned about the future. Do you want to add more or about the suggestion, what we could do more? Thank you. Uh, yes, I, I can uh, say uh, a little bit about our role as the Swedish Development Corporation and, and the Swedish Embassy here in, in Bangkok uh, that is um, uh, handling the regional Swedish cooperation in Asia and the Pacific. And the mandate for us is to contribute to strengthen the ability of regional actors to deal with transboundary challenges and opportunities in the areas of human rights, democracy, gender equality, environment, and climate change. But we also have the mandate to support research cooperation with this, within these areas. And this means research capacity, research production, and innovation, which can be understood as the research results that come to use in policy. So we strongly believe we need more evidence-based decision-making, and to get the evidence, we need policy-relevant research. Research that take into account gender and human rights perspectives to provide a solid base for policymakers. There also need to be proactive ways to make researchers and policymakers meet and work together, not only delivering knowledge one way, but co-creating for maximum relevance. It is also very important to take into account the aspects of academic freedom. Academic freedom and open communication in findings, hypotheses, and opinions lies at the very heart of research and provides the strongest guarantee of the accuracy and objectivity of research. Swedish research support has a clear pro-poor and human right focus, including gender equality and aims at addressing the power and knowledge imbalance between high and low income countries. And we believe this is essential in order to reach a more resilient and equitable future for all. Thank you. Dr. Vijan, you have yeah. very short. Yeah, very short. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think the, the uh, science policy, we, we, we need to make a stronger bit, how we, we link together, especially uh, a researcher. Some researchers, uh, they just want to, to research something they are really interested in. But uh, put in the shell. But policy, you have to ask policy. What policy uh, do we need, uh, especially to uh, deepen uh, the policy to solve the problem in developing country? Many common problems still need uh, the policy. And the important thing is to translate the scientific information uh, to the public uh, in general and also to the uh, policy decision making is also very important. Uh, some uh, uh, researchers just produce really uh, informative, scientific information, but uh, decision making uh, uh, sometimes they really difficult to understand. But I think it's very important if we can like uh, to find some key area, common area that the uh, both uh, policy and uh, researcher, I think researcher, uh, the outcome from 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 the the research uh, will really. Uh, 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 useful for decision making and for deepening the, the country 
uh, as a whole. Thank you very much. So, Stefanos, would you like to say shortly one minute? Um, I, would, I would have three specific recommendations. One is about making more research and proving what is the role of sustainable management of natural resources into the entire development process. And I think we need very strong research to showcase that there are limits on using natural resources and that uh, what we are using today, we will not have it available for the future. So we need this, this balance between <clears throat> what I would call to, to, to have the borders between growth and development because we have an understanding and I think it's a false understanding that development means growth, but this is not correct. Uh, development needs growth, but growth doesn't mean development any time. And there's a lot of growth that actually does not lead to development. The second recommendation would be um, <clears throat> we need to find, to have more research on technologies and policies that they will allow what we call decoupling of resource use from economic growth. And um, we have very good um, business cases right now that they are still on the pilot phase. And I think we need more research on how these pilot business cases on resource efficiency could be what I will call the future business as usual way. And the third, we need to find out, and I think this is um, a little bit sensitive. We go back to the Club of Rome that talk about the limits to growth and really need a serious discussion between policymakers, scientists, and international institutions to, to understand what are the limits to growth. And we do have environmental limits, we do have social limits, and we need to see them in order to overcome them. Thank you so much. We have good suggestions for um, uh, policymakers and also the main partner. Here, let's hear the response back for um, research and academic institutes how you would really respond to the questions and also their suggestion from our friends here. So, Professor right, Bandi, uh, please. Based on the previous uh, suggestions, I think uh, the university should focus on the uh, two key things more. Or the first one is on the knowledge creation and uh, research. And the other one is um, how to bring upon all this research and knowledge to social contribution. So by doing so, I think uh, the university need to do two key things. One is we need to sharpen our focus. That means uh, the research and knowledge that we have been doing for many years, we need to sharpen it to really serve what it needs. It's, there is no time to just uh, waste and doing something uh, not useful. That means that we need to uh, put more focus on what we are doing. And at the same time, we need also uh, to integrate several uh, people from uh, several disciplines to work together to create or innovate new things to serve the changing world. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's very important statement for all students and also ourselves as researchers. So how about Osa? What you will respond? Yes, what I, do I say from an SCI perspective? Uh, thanks for really good recommendations. We'll take them to our heart. Um, I think, well, we need to reach out to change makers in the region and help them. I mean, we, we obviously can't drive the process ourselves. We're here, we're here to support. And I think SCI Asia is uh, growing very rapidly uh, in a very positive way. So I'm, I'm very optimistic about the center's role in the region. Um, and also, many other centers are working a lot in Asia, have a lot of competence and expertise from, from work in the field as well. So I think SA is very well positioned to make a contribution um, through our niche and mandate 
an approach and expertise in bridging science, uh, policy, and also practice, um, mm -hmm. and to build capacity among boundary partners and stakeholders of the region. And we can combine this regional expertise with uh, the more global um, competence and expertise we have in greater network in the region. And there's quite a few interesting uh, projects going on like Summonet in, in the region, which is about uh, enabling and supporting local actors. And also other work being done at the SA York Center in the region as well. So, and there's more to come, I hope. We look forward to collaborating. Okay, so thank you so much for all panelists. It will be really the hardest job for me to summarize this fruitful discussion. But I think I have about three key messages to tell my son. The first is, it seems like the future of Asia in the view of great leaders here on the stage, and also majority of participants here feel Asia will remain to be a legion for diversities. There will be a lot of things happening positively and a lot of challenges that we are facing. Despite our current effort, many global agreement, regional agreement, we seem not fast enough to address emerging challenges and future challenges. And what we need to do here, we got a lot of good suggestion. We need to be creative. We need to cooperate more. We need to be innovative, how to turn crisis into opportunities. This is not the task of the great leaders who are on the stage here, but the task of everyone in this room and also including those who are living in this planet in Asia to make sure that we have future Asia, which is very resilient, equitable, and also sustainable for all, the next generation. And I would like to give this opportunity to invite all audience here to give a big hand for all wonderful speakers on the stage. This is for their insight and suggestion and commitment to continue supporting the good initiative in the future. And also give big hands to yourself. <laughs> for your commitment to do a good work that you need to be, to do, whatever the role you have. And I will tell my son, you have, you have to do your assignment and homework. And you need to be a good student. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chanis, for a very interesting debate there. Um, we're just going to have a quick change on the, t on the stage here. We're getting ready to just sign the MOU with Professor uh, Bundit and with Johan. John, if you could join us on stage as well, please. Um, we'll get that ready now. Professor Urkorn, we could.
could you sign my paycheck at the same time, please? So, professors, thank you very much for this MOU. And I would just like to take this opportunity also to personally really thank you and the university for 10 years of really good collaboration, but also for the opportunity to be here at your premises today. Yep. And you have told me now many times this morning that you only sign MOU that you expect really be something with, where you work with later on. So we have a lot of expectation right now to mm -hmm. deliver on the MOU. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to take this opportunity to say a few words. And uh, I really thank uh, the SEI for a long-term partnership. Uh, we have been uh, collaborating for many years. And uh, I would like to assure you that uh, we would like to collaborate more and work together, creating some impactful to the society. And uh, I'm sure that uh, we are waiting for a bright future to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get on with the day. Um, Johan might be slipping away, but we're going to call him back uh, in a moment to give his uh, opening remarks to us as well. So, Johan. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. I'm just looking for the changer here. So, it's really great to be here in Bangkok, in Asia, and finally, it, it felt like I reached position where I should be, signing MOUs, you know. And I, I really think that what we signed today was obviously a lot more positive than what world leaders in another country currently is signing a lot right now. This is about the future. This is about collaboration. Uh, let's see now if it works. Okay. So, uh, I've been asked in about 15 minutes to give a very brief introduction to, to you. Okay. I, I made a quick error. We need to take a photograph before a professor can leave. So, can we so you down? can now see why some people become executive directors and some only center directors. Come on, Lyle. I'm learning from you. <laughs> so, what, orchestrate us. Just sit down here. We take ah, okay. That's okay. Are, are you feeling okay now? Are you ready? Great. Wonderful. 
We're all in the limelight, obviously. So it's wonderful to be here. It's really wonderful also to have this opportunity to have the first SCI Science Forum outside of Stockholm in Bangkok, Asia. And I'm actually so pleased personally about this because when I came in a few years back in 2010, 11, 12, this was, to be quite honest, a center in a lot of trouble. We had a lot of challenges. And the fact that we are now here today with a very strong team in place, organizing this forum, high quality, that is absolutely astonishing. So I know that you've been sitting for a long time. Let's give ourselves a big applaud for this achievement. <laughs> Don't look so uncomfortable. They did that you know, in the old Soviet Union all the time. They were applauding it, it, you know, it themselves. So anyway, uh, a very short presentation on SCI, and I'm going to give it in a different way. I'm not going to talk so much about the organization. I want to give the environment we are working in, you can say. As Shastin was uh, stating in her opening remarks, science is so important to identify the challenges of society. But increasingly, and I think this is also the DNA of SEI, at least I want it to be the, the DNA of SEI, is that science is also key for identifying the opportunities and the solutions of the future. And I, I think we've seen that already in the panel. This is the organization. It is about people, it's about the future generations, and this is what we do. We focus on environment, but we also believe in our vision that we need to have a sustainable and prosperous future for everyone. We cannot have a prosperous future if we don't have environmental sustainability. We cannot reach environmental sustainability if we do not have prosperous societies where people are included. This is very obvious today in society where we have a challenge of connecting with people, quite frankly, all over the world. Our mission from the start in 1989 is to bridge science and policy. That sounds nice and simple, but it is, of course, very challenging. It's about being relevant. It's about providing information. It's about providing facts, scientific insights in a format that policymakers can use and find relevant. And this is sometimes quite challenging. This is the structure of the organization. And as you can see, we put three areas as equally important. The scientific research, the policy engagement, and the capacity development. All of these are th three professional areas that are equally important in the organization. And we have representatives here in the Asia Center, but also from across the Institute covering these areas. But equally important is to have a well-functioning organization and not least, least to also reach out into society. So for instance, communication is a key area for SEI. And we have a lot of our communications team here. Almost everyone is actually here in Asia today. So can you raise your hand also from the communications team? They're all sitting over there. Okay, that's good. So communication is key to us, but also all other areas to have a well-functioning organization, finance, HR, tools, platforms, etc. is really fundamental for us to deliver. These are our offices around the world. We are about 230 people working in nine offices in six countries. And we are, to a certain extent, reflecting the world. And this is also critical. Diversity is in itself a strength. If you want to address sustainability, societal challenges, you have to be as diverse as society. We are close to 50-50 in terms of men and women. We are about more than 55 nationalities today working in SEI. This is extremely important for us. It gives different dimensions, different capacities, different types of knowledge that we try to integrate. And we do have challenges. Of course, Shastin, you are absolutely right. The science is about identifying challenges that we have, that we are facing. This is the reality of SEI. This is also part of our world. And looking at Asia, we have heard already that so many of these challenges are real here. This is one example. Uh, I could give many, many different examples, of course, but urban development being one of the key drivers of society today. We are far from sustainable. This is how mo most urban areas look like today, unfortunately. We have an urbanization rate of about 50 million people per year in the world. If we take one country in Asia, India, 
they expect about 400 million more people living in cities by 2050. They are about to build infrastructure. We heard about infrastructure before from our friend from UNSCAP. They're about to build infrastructure equaling more than all American cities in the next 35 years. In the next 35 years. If they build cities looking like this, we will not have sustainable societies. They might be climate smart because it's poor, maybe, but it's not a sustainable society. And we know what the consequences are of urban planning failing. And these are areas that SCI are working with a lot, looking at how we can avoid locking into unsustainable societies. We have many people, a very strong research looking at air pollution, also uh, as complement to climate change. Air pollution and climate change are, of course, integrated in many ways. We know, however, that air pollution is also a driver for development today, a push for a better life as well. Industrialization continues in a way that is highly unsustainable, and it's not just about air pollution, it's about natural resources also. How can development actually lead to an industrialization which is also positive for society and also deal with environmental issues at the same time? And massive expansion of agriculture all over the world, connecting us, not least between Europe and Asia, for instance. Palm oil as one example, uh, but we can also look at soy, we can look at beef, we can look at so many different areas in terms of agriculture connecting us, where there are huge challenges. And we have soil degradation, one of the scandals of the world, one of the most precious resources that we have, and something that we are also looking at a lot in SEI, trying to understand the processes, but of course also what the solutions can be. And soil erosion is a major challenge globally today. If we are to double food production to 2050, which is the expectation, this will not be possible if we continue to treat our soils in the way we are doing today. The consequences of these are many, and in terms of climate, you are aware of it. 2016 was the warmest year on measured record, uh, in combination with El Nino, of course, but still a quite dramatic increase. And we have also then uh, subsidiary effects of climate change, such as sea level rise, for instance, and the consequences this will have for uh, countries in the world. You, you are aware, aware of the rapid urbanization that we have. Most urban areas are, of course, located in low-lying areas, in coastal areas. We are in one of those cities today. Uh, the challenges are immense, uh, clearly. So I could, of course, end the classical presentation here with the pictures that we see every day, uh, we saw them even in the panel. These are moving a little bit, but are the same, same kind of pictures that we are seeing often. Uh, and we could, of course, also you know, communicate the doom and gloom of the political society. So science tells us that the world is hopeless and policymakers agree. And this was, of course, the situation in, in Copenhagen in 2009, where this picture is coming from a geopolitical system that couldn't respond to the challenges we had, and uh, delegations that were quite uh, tired, to be honest, after many years of negotiations. How many people were in Copenhagen in 2009? I know there are some, of course. Do you recognize yourself? Yes, not even the polar bear they had you know, placed outside of the convention center was actually melting symbolically, as it was meant to do, because it was very cold that December in Copenhagen. So we have an impossible future, Shayanis. You can tell your son, don't study, don't care, you know, just rest, have fun while it lasts, or can we actually move forward? And this is also about SCI. The opportunities, six years after Paris, we had a completely different political situation. Not in the world, I would say. If you're looking at many of the conferences that have been successful, the political environment has also been quite positive. In 1992, we had the the, fall, the Cold War ending. In 2000, when we had the Millennium Development Goals, it was the new millennium, everything was positive. In 2015, despite challenge in the world, the political system came together with finance for development, with the, the, MD, the, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, and with the Paris Agreement. So we know we can take steps forward, and the SDGs are really uh, quite amazing as a framework 
something that is really in the DNA today of the organization. And I'm fascinated to see how many countries, cities, companies are today using the SDGs as a framework for development. And this is, of course, something that we also try to contribute with and support many actors how they can do that in an efficient way. The transitions in terms of energy has been immense since 2009 and is likely one of the drivers behind the fact that we managed to get an agreement in Paris. In 2009, leaders were still very worried about what a transition would mean. The fact that we had to share the burden, the costs. In 2015, we had a completely different situation. And if we just take one graphic to show the price of solar from Copenhagen in 2009 to Paris in 2015, this is how it displays. It's a very dramatic shift in the world that has happened. And we, of course, hope that we've been part of this. And I couldn't help selecting a short thing that came in the British media in April. I think this is symbolic. It's 24 hours in the country of the re uh, Industrial Revolution producing electricity without coal. I hope it's true and not fake facts, but at least this is a symbolic. And we will see these kind of developments in many parts of the world, in a country where they a few years back said, we will never abandon coal. This is what we could see and read, read in the media in May this year. So SEI is also part of driving the sustainability and the future we want to see. Finding the solutions, trying to embrace development, embrace opportunities that would take us forward, not just looking at the challenges, but also trying to understand and see how we can push uh, opportunities. One area that we are expanding into more and more is the private sector looking at business development, innovation in business. And unfortunately, I would say, we, we have some work still to reach out towards the private sector. They are key drivers for development today. And we have been working a lot in Sweden, for instance, with the Swedish steel industry. Four years ago, they were deadly skeptical towards climate policies because they are the biggest contributor of emissions in Sweden. Today, they are driving themselves and arguing that they will be CO2 free, fossil free by 2050. That's the ambition they have. So a rapid transformation also in the private sector is key. And we start to see results. And I will end with a couple of quick, just demonstrating that we see results. In 2015, this again was quite revolutionary. More than 50% of the added generation capacity was actually uh, renewables in 2015. Nobody had really expected this. And we can also see in terms of emissions in the last three years that we have maybe leveled out, maybe leveled out. This is only three years. Again, the challenges are still there, but we have to also embrace the fact that we are making uh, progress in terms of commitments. So as we also stated in the new climate economy where we collaborated with many different organizations, this is an historic opportunity we have right now. We have historic challenges, we have historic opportunities. There are clearly politicians working against this agenda, so sometimes you have to also demonstrate that in their own countries, development has actually bypassed their own mental mind. So while they think they are still locked into the fossil society, the future is actually already there, according to their own agencies. The job creation and the number of people working in the renewable sectors in the United States today are far higher than in the fossil industry. So this is a development which is also extremely important for us. And we are, as the SEI, of course, doing everything right. So this is the slide I more or less want to end up with. The fact that we, yes, thank you. Very, I, I didn't tell them to do that beforehand. So but why, why, why don't we do it again? Yes, come on. Yes. <laughs> so in 2017, in January, we got, for the first time, we were uh, li uh, ranked as the number one organization in terms of, of environmental policy in the world. And all my colleagues in here are really behind this achievement. But not only them, but also the partners that we have in this region, 
and all over the world because this is also part of the SCI DNA. It's about collaboration. We can never solve this agenda if we do not work together. This is why we're here today. As Niall was saying in his opening, use this day to really discuss, talk, argue about things, but also look ahead and see how we can find joint solutions. So from one city to another, thank you very much, and I really look forward to today, Niall, and I hope that we will have an inspiring day together. Thank you. Thank you, Johan. Um, I think you start us off with the inspiration, so we'll keep going from there. Um, we're running a few minutes late, but uh, if you don't mind, we're going to do five, uh, three five-minute speed talks about some of the critical areas we're trying to develop and push forward in Asia before coffee break. Um, and then we go into the longer debates of the, the three sessions that we talked about. So I just want to call up the first of the, our new researchers in town, Oliver Johnson, uh, is looking at five minutes into the energy situation in Asia. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Oliver Johnson, and I'm a senior research fellow at uh, the Stockholm Environment Institute. I'm sort of transitioning. I've been uh, based at the SEI Africa office in Nairobi for four years now, and moving now here to Bangkok, which is an exciting opportunity and challenge for me uh, as I look to uh, lead uh, the energy work at the SEI Asia office. So as we've heard already, it, you know, this is an extremely dynamic region. Uh, a lot of change has been happening over the past decades and expectations are that this, these trends will continue as population may continue to grow, uh, economic um, growth uh, continues. And so this has major implications on energy systems, which will be forced, be required to adapt and to develop and grow, to meet growing demand for energy. So I've grabbed a few graphics from the IEA, the International Energy Agency's uh, Southeast Asia outlook from 2015. So at the moment, I'll just speak uh, to the Southeast Asia region. And of course, one of the major issues is meeting energy, increasing energy demand needs over the next 20 to 30 years. There is an expectation that much of this will also be met by continued or an increased use of fossil fuels, which has significant implications for climate change commitments. At the same time, many countries in the region still face challenges in addressing energy access. So as Johan had put up, SDG, uh, the SDGs, SDG 7 is about clean and affordable energy. And so on the one hand, we could, the region could be meeting its energy demand, but it may not be equitably uh, doing so. So that's, that's a real consideration and it needs to Needs, uh, needs attention. There are a range of uh, policy options touted for how to meet increasing demand needs, but in a, in a cleaner way. So we have sort of energy efficiency measures, reducing inefficient coal. But the challenge really is how do you do that given that some of the industries uh, in the fossil fuel industry, for instance, have very, very strong roots. And there's a, a political economy issue in terms of changing um, the, the kind of way that the energy sectors develop uh, and, and moving away from path dependency. And of course, the countries in the region each have different political contexts, different natural resources to to exploit, and they also have um, different histories. And SEI has been working in the region on energy for, for some time. We've been working, looking at issues such as uh, uh, incentivizing renewables, uh, mechanisms to incentivize renewables, challenges of uh, d 
destabilizing existing energy uh, systems, um, gender awareness in a very traditionally en uh, male-dominated uh, sector. And so the SEI Asia research agenda seeks to build on this existing work and build on our existing partnerships to develop new collaborations and explore new issues and ideas, uh, co-produce new knowledge uh, on energy issues and how to overcome them in the region to support policy and practice towards a more low carbon development pathway in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oliver. Um, and for anybody out there, please feel free to get in touch with Oliver. He's now based here. Um, we are very keen to try and work with partners on, on this issue. Uh, Steve is eager to go. I can see him standing up there. So uh, Dr. Steve Sindeby, if you'd like to join us, he's going to be looking at urbanization issues. Because the slide changed, Niall. The slide changed. My name comes up. I stand up. Um, so I'm Steve Sindeby from York. I'd like to thank this opportunity to start discussing a potential new initiative that we've been developing looking around urbanization issues. Uh, we've heard a lot about that already. Oh. And I have no slides, so I shall just... Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll talk my way through what the initiative's hopefully going to be about. So, okay, brilliant. We have some slides. Yay. So we've heard already that urbanization is one of the key focuses around the SDGs. Um, it's got its own specific dedicated SDG, but it touches on lots of the different topics across the different um, SDG goals. And a key factor, as we've heard from uh, Johan this morning, is, is partly around the quality of urban infrastructure and how that determines residents' quality of life. So this is uh, Sir Norman Foster, a leading architect, and his views on that. And this is one of the aspects that the initiative will be touching on, is, is about how infrastructure affects different people living in our cities and their quality of life. Okay, so we, we know that urban environments are affecting people's health as they live in cities. Um, the one I particularly like to focus on is this last one coming up, is around the mental health and well-being of people. Um, so the World Health Organization is now predicting that actually by 2030, mental health problems are going to be one of the leading uh, diseases in our cities, overtaking things like malaria. So it's an increasing concern. And I think we need to better understand how and who is being affected by the quality of our cities and how that's affecting their mental health and well-being. But also, can we learn anything about beneficial environments and spaces in cities that are actually promoting good health and well-being? So what, what can we learn around what should we be including in our cities? How should we be promoting their development? So for me, I'm a firm believer that, that residents are experts about their own cities, that they, they know about their experience of living in their urban environments. So a key factor of what we're proposing in the initiative is around this idea of co-creation of knowledge and co-design. So asking the people themselves about their knowledge of the city and how it operates and how they feel it's affecting them. But I think we can also start to use more novel approaches, and these are things we've been trialing in York, using uh, different sensing technology to actually understand the physiological uh, relationship between urban environments and how it affects people's health and well-being. So these are sensors looking at how it's actually affecting your brain activity as you move around a city. And I think these more novel approaches are things that SEI can start to bring on to city development in Asia and Africa as well to understand how those environments are affecting the people that live there. Another aspect is actually getting citizens themselves and co-producing knowledge about their environments. So in, in York, we've been working a lot with our Nairobi uh, partners in SCI, developing citizen science approaches to understand urban environments and their effect on health. So one of the simplest things, or simplest from my point of view, is understanding something like air pollution measures and getting local uh, residents involved in actually collecting new data about the quality of their environments using citizen science monitoring. And then you can also start to include other factors such as uh, heat, mobility, 
and that interaction between the social and the environmental, so the connection between how people are using their cities and how that's affecting their health, but also the interaction with the environment. So hopefully that's given you just a brief flavor about potential elements that are gonna be involved in the initiative. The other elements we're developing are around modeling and also governance, but we'd like to connect all these different approaches together about looking at the impacts of infrastructure on health, then co-creating and monitoring urban environments and linking that into modeling and, and governance systems. So that's what we'll be developing over the next few months, hopefully, with colleagues in Africa and Asia. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, look forward to some exciting work there. And then finally, I'd like to call on uh, Chusit. Uh, there you are. Uh, Chusit is the head of our water and resource management team here. So, um. Thank you, Neil. Sawadee Good morning. My name is Chusit. Uh, I'm a program manager and water cluster leader in uh, Asia Center. So let's talk a little bit on about water-related activity in Asia. A picture say a thousand words, but I will not show you only a picture. So I will show you like a, a series of photos that can describe our water-related activities in, in our center. So this is like a, a photo of a group expert meeting together with the local people in Chinwin area in Myanmar. So we try to understand what are like uh, the issues related to drought management in the area together with our uh, partner in Myanmar MEI, Myanmar Airmen Institute. So together with uh, a handsome guy, you see that, Niall, together with also like a beautiful lady, Cheyenneist. So we have uh, organized a booth in, in Myanmar, uh, the big event called World Water Day. So we have like our booth to show our uh, activities in Myanmar in 2015, I guess. And also like we work together with pollution control department. Thank you, Dr. Vijan, that we uh, are highly support us on the capacity building together with uh, our local partner in Myanmar, Myanmar Human Institute, to build their capacity related to water quality monitoring. And also we work together with uh, relevant agency to understand what could be like potential future scenario so that we can support a uh, river basin uh, management. So you see that there are different campaigns and we discuss together with the local partner on what should be like a, a future development plan. We organize a stakeholder consultation meeting together with a local partner in Myanmar so that we can discuss about what will be like structure and roles, responsibility of river basin organization. I will stop now. So like I said, this is only uh, already like 6,000 words. So there are also lots of activity. Also, we do modeling. Uh, Chinese was also interviewed by local media on the impact of uh, my mining and also uh, different development in Chinwin on water quality. So now come why we have our vision on safe and secure water resource for present and future generation in Asia. With the recent rapid economic development, there are lots of pressure on limited water resource in the region, and how can we manage this uh, limited resource in the river basin? And with like uh, uncertainty, how can we address that? This photo was taken from our trip on the way to a remote area in, in Chinwin in Myanmar. And we were stuck there for a couple of hours because there, there was a, a construction. So how can we address this? So our mission is to enhance the capacity of all sectors, household, industry, agriculture, energy, and environment in Asia to achieve water security and practice uh, sustainable water resource management. So we believe that conducting a research at the ground and carrying our demonstration could also help people in the region to build their capacity and promote sharing experience and, and lesson learned for water management for all water users. Our objectives, three main, conduct evidence-based research to support and promote effective decision-making for achieving water security and sustainable water resource management, to strengthen multi-stakeholder policy engagement in decision-making process and enhance capacity of 
water user at all level in integrated water resource management. So this is our potential battery partners at different levels, starting from regional level. So we plan to collaborate with uh, ASEAN, Secretariat and Working Group on Water Resource Management, ASEAN Climate Resilient Network, Mekong River Commission, Lan Chang Mekong Corporation, Serbia Mekong, and other INGO. At national level, so we plan to work with uh, different departments under Ministry of Natural Resource and Environment. For example, Department of Water Resource, Department of Meteorology and Hydrology, and Pollution Control Department. Again, thank you, Dr. Vijan. Uh, Ministry of Agriculture, we plan to work with Irrigation Department. Apart from that, we also want to work with uh, water-related disaster issue. So we plan to work with uh, different departments under Ministry of Interior, which focus on disaster management, and also our uh, author university and academic institute. At sub-national level, we plan to work with local government and also river basin organization and community-based committee. So expected outcome, three expected outcome that we aim for the next three years. So open planning and decision making process to address uncertainty into planning and to strengthen the linkage between local knowledge, science, policy, and try to address our uh, challenges issue related to water resource management the last one, to strengthen institutional capacity for local national stakeholder for integrated water resource management. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jusit. Um, I know these five minutes don't do justice to all the incredible work that each of these teams are doing, so please do take a little bit of time to get to know them, talk to them, and explore what they're doing. Um, it was just an opportunity to try and expose a little bit more of the work that we're doing before we go into a little more in-depth uh, in the particular sessions after coffee break. Um, so with that,